Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ian Dale All Talk podcast. I'm Ian Dale. This is the podcast where we talk to people in politics, the media, possibly a few in the world of sport as well and entertainment about their lives, their career, their motivations, their, lo- their loves, their hates and whatever takes my fancy. Well, today we're going to be talking to Lord Adonis, Andrew Adonis, who, if you're interested in politics, if you're interested in Brexit, um, he is somebody who provokes... Well, a lot of loyalty on one side and a lot of criticism on the other. We're not just going to talk about Brexit for the next hour, though, I hope. There's much more to Andrew Adonis than just Brexit. Welcome. Thank Um, you, Ian. But let's start off with Brexit, shall we? Um, When David Cameron announced in 2013, I think it was, in his Bloomberg speech, that there was going to be a referendum, did you at that point have any idea about how involved you would become in this debate? Not remotely. Because uh, and my career, you said, well, uh, talk about Brexit and one or two other things. Until the Brexit referendum, it's not even um, 2013, until uh, June 2016, I played no part in this at all. I think I made did one thing during the Brexit referendum. And I remember it was at very short notice. They were There was a debate going on with John Redwood and the guy who was supposed to be debating with John Red, Redwood dropped out and the BBC phoned me saying, could I come at short notice? Um, I've never seen foreign policy or Europe as part of what I do. My big thing, as you know, I mean, you and I have sort of talked about this over the years, my big thing has been trying to transform the state of the country, public services, all the big Blair ed- yeah. uh, education reforms, HS2, those Which we things. will talk about later. Yeah, and all those were hugely important to me. I'm also a bit of a historian, and, you know, I've written a biography of Ernie Bevin, and I've been really interested in what makes a, a modern progressive parties tick you know ernie bevin the creator of nato the federal republic of germany the greatest trade union leader in the history of the country those are the things that interest me i just assumed i think probably like a lot of people actually which may be the reason why the brexit referendum went as it did in 2016 that the eu thing was a done deal there was it was clearly still controversy but because i don't follow the conservative party closely i wasn't i wasn't seized of the fact that what a, a sort of revolution was brewing in the conservatives i thought what was happening was a kind of of um a faragist uh, fringe that was there i hadn't realized it was mainstreaming in british politics i'm not sure it was and at that point well, it certainly was a complete um, revelation to me when the referendum went the wrong way in 2016. And even then, I hadn't intended to get particularly involved. It's just that my all of my being is internationalist, pro-European. I see it as part of the progressive... Um, and well, you're, uh, you're effectively a Jenkins side, yeah, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Roy was, was along with Ted Heath, probably the second most important person mm. in taking us into the EU. And, of course, he was only Britain's only president of the European Commission. And even then, I hadn't intended to get involved. I kept expecting other people who were much more expert in Europe and had been you know, debating these issues for ages to do it. I was chairing the National Infrastructure Commission at this point. My big concern was to get a fast railway service between Liverpool, Manchester and Leeds. This is the big thing. And I was in battles with the Treasury literally, even though George Osborne had been appointed me, of course the Treasury was against this big investment. What was now called levelling up, I was sort of doing about 20 years before people started using the phrase, both in schools, the public services, but also the whole point of HS2 and this revolution in transport in the north, which is what HS2 is about, getting from London to Birmingham to Manchester and then across the north more quickly, we would now think of as levelling up. But then I suddenly noticed, four or five months after the 2016 referendum, that I think largely because of Jeremy Corbyn being leader of the Labour Party, no one from the progressive tradition was actually standing up for Europe. And my view, I mean, you you may disagree with this, my view is that there was a potential majority to stop Brexit. We'll never know, because there was never a second referendum. But it was pretty close, first time around 52-48. The polls were showing that there was a majority that didn't like the terms of the deal. Uh, Theresa May was clearly uh, floundering over trying to get the terms of Brexit. And I thought some decent leadership of the Labour Party could probably pull this back and that the right thing for Labour and the country was to stay in. But I hadn't intended that this was going to take over my life and it was a complete surprise to me when it it did so. Do you think genuinely that if Keir Starmer or Ed Miliband had been leader in the the Labour Party in that period, do you genuinely think that that could have happened? I don't know. I'm certain that... Jeremy Corbyn was the worst possible leader, not only because, of course, he was a massive turn-off to Middle England, 
Uh, he, Jeremy Corbyn was never going to win an election, you know, even against mm. an imploding Theresa May in 2017. You remember the manifesto where the social care plan literally imploded in the yeah. middle of the election. Uh, the Tories still got 50 seats more. When people say Labour did well in 2017, if there was ever an election which Labour could have won by default, it was 2017, and they didn't. The Conservatives were still the largest party. So I never thought that Jeremy Corbyn was going to do it, and not just because he was no good in Middle England. I mean, he's left-wing extremist, let's be clear. I mean, he's totally and completely unelectable by mm. Middle England, but also he's anti-European. He had himself campaigned against every European treaty of the last uh, 40 years, beginning with um, entry in the 1970s, and he regarded the European Union and the European Commission as a capitalist plot. So the idea that Jeremy Corbyn, who I don't think made... Uh, more than one feeble contribution in the 2016 referendum was going to be the person who would lead uh, a campaign to keep us in was always fanciful. I don't think Ed Miliband was that strong a leader and um, so I'm not sure. It's, it's very difficult rerunning history whether things would have been different. I do think if Tony Blair or a genuine leader had been uh, in charge of the Labour Party, the referendum wouldn't have gone that way in 2016 and we would have pulled it back. But, you know, we're some way from the genius of Tony Blair in modern Labour politics at the moment. I wondered how long it would take you to mention Tony Blair, but we may come back to him. Well, we will come back to him um, a little bit later. Of course, wh when you became one of the de facto leaders of the second referendum camp, I mean, there wasn't actually a... Which is part of the campaign, problem. There was wasn't there. actually a but leader. You, you yeah. and Alastair Campbell, I always think of mm. as the two people that and were really Hezo, pushing it. Michael Heseltine was out there in a bit. Yeah, to an, to an mm. extent. But I think you, you were much more vocal, mm. particularly on social media. A lot of people said, well, this is a bit of a cheek, an unelected peer trying to teach us all about democracy. A and yet it was a majority in, OK, 4% mm. majority, but a, a million mm. people extra had voted leave. Did you never have any qualms about ha about the longer term effects on democracy if indeed that had been reversed? Well, I was always completely clear that it could only be reversed by another democratic act. It was never my view, and I never said this at any stage in the Brexit battles, that Parliament should somehow arrogate to itself the power to override um, a referendum. That's why the campaign was for a second referendum. I mean, uh, some of my friends persuaded us that we should call it a people's vote, as mm. if somehow it was different from a second referendum. I was always very clear, because, you know, what's on the tin is, I mean, the, the, the Brits are a, a, a serious and so I found that the most irritating they know. phrase. Yeah, I know. But I was always very clear <laughs> it was a second referendum. Do I have a problem with a second referendum reversing a first referendum? There's nothing undemocratic about that, just as there's nothing undemocratic about a, a, a second election reversing a first election. We've had three general elections in uh, in four years but in a England. A so referendum it wasn't is different, isn't it? A referendum, it is always seen as, and maybe not in other countries, but in this country, it's always seen as a sort of once in a generation Well, well we've, had, we've had very few referendums. So the truth is, the absolute truth is, like a lot of the British Constitution, you're sort of making it up. Mm. I certainly didn't think, and I still don't think, that a second referendum reaching a different conclusion from a first referendum is undemocratic. I do think that Parliament or smoke-filled rooms, what we used to call them, aren't any smoke in them anymore, but, you know, politicians just gathering together and mm. ignoring the people, that isn't satisfactory. And uh, I don't think that the, the Brits would have put up with that. Now, ultimately, of course, we did have what was effectively a second referendum. We had the 2019 election. And what this whole battle was about between 2018, 2017 and 2019, I was always clear about it, wasn't whether the British people would give a view, because it was the British people who resolved this issue in the 2019 election. It was whether it was going to be resolved by another referendum or another general election. Now, the reason I was always so keen on having it done by a referendum rather than an election is that being like you, a seasoned politician, it was patently obvious that an election where the choice was between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, that only ever had one result. Let's be clear, there was simply no way. Mm. That the, if the British people weren't prepared to choose Jeremy Corbyn over an imploding Theresa May in 2017, there was no way they were changing that. And that's the problem. The exam question for a general election, quite rightly, my latest book is all about political leaders, quite rightly is about the choice of the Prime Minister. That's quite right. That is what elections determine. And the issue of Brexit was always going to be secondary there, whereas if there had been a second referendum, then and the issue would be, do you like the terms of Brexit, the actual nuts and bolts, what's going to happen to your trade, your jobs, your income, and so on. I think we would have won it. But, of course, Jeremy Corbyn himself, in a kind of conspiracy of, of, of I, as I see it, old left and Farage East right, went along with the election 
which I mean must be one of the the, the most extraordinary suicide pacts it's of quite, modern politics. It, well, yes and no. It's quite difficult for an opposition leader when they've constantly been calling for an election suddenly to say, no, we're not having one. Now, he did that for a couple mm. of months, but it was never going to be a sustainable but, position, but he, was but it? But he constantly voted against a second referendum because what he wanted was... Of course, there was clearly going to have to be a, uh, an election fairly soon because you had a hung parliament, a government with no majority and so on. But the order I was going for, which was perfectly democratic, was second referendum followed by election... What did Jeremy Corbyn want? Election in this fanciful belief that the that the British public was somehow going to make him prime minister. But and the one thing that was never going to happen in this saga at any stage was, mm. I'm afraid, Jeremy Corbyn becoming prime minister. When you heard the size of the Conservative majority in December 2019, did you instantly recognise that the game was over? The game was over for the short term. Yeah, obviously, because there was a majority. The 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 Brexit deal had been uh, negotiated and so on. Uh, you never know how quickly things can change in politics. And I'm, I am uh, chair of the European movement. Uh, our campaigning at the moment... Which is... I used to be a member of. You, well, you can yeah, rejoin. There's a surprise, isn't oh, it? Uh, 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 no, in the 1980s, I was going around doing speeches for the European oh, movement well, when I... Labour were um, a campaigning against EEC membership at the time. Um, you'll know Mark Seddon, the ex-editor yeah. of Tribune. Well, he and I were sort of opponents at the University of East Anglia. And I can remember doing debates with him and many others. Um, well, how, how times change, eh? Well, it, it, why, don't, why aren't we reunited? <laughs> I think this could be great that you as a, a as, a, as, a, as a campaign <laughs> of the European Movement. I like this idea more One and more. thing I do agree with you, though, on this, that, and I think I read you said this somewhere recently, that if we rejoined... Uh, Actually, maybe not recently. If we rejoined, we would have to join the euro because that was actually mm. always my position. Mm. That if Britain had voted to remain, or by reasonable mm. majority, I thought it was an entirely logical position to stop this half in, half out mm. thing, which we've been going through mm. essentially for forty mm. years. And that would have been at the point where we probably might have thought about taking the plunge of joining the euro. To me, there's you either are either fully in. Or you're fully out. Well, the, the book I wrote before I, I did my chapter... You've done a in, lot of books. In, yeah, <laughs> but before I wrote my, my chapter on Tony Blair in, in your book on Prime Ministers, mm. which everyone should read because it's fant a fantastic collection of, um, a, a, of essays, the book I wrote before then was called Half In, Half yeah. Out. And it went right back to the 70s because the first big decision Britain takes in relation to Europe after it joins and the referendum goes two to one in favour of staying in in 1975, is not to join the exchange rate mechanism, which is the precursor to what yeah. became the single currency. And that was the Callaghan government that decided that. And a big battle, as you know, and the Thatcher government all the way through is whether they would or wouldn't join the ERM. And this uh, constant... Um, uh, resorts to opting out whatever is the next European project goes right back to the beginning of Britain's membership of the EU, as you say, with the exchange rate mechanism. If instead our strategy had been that we were going to be seeking to lead the European Union, which we never sought to do, except briefly, ironically, under Margaret Thatcher with the single market, the 19, what was called the 1992 mm. campaign to remove trade barriers. But apart from that brief period of, what, three or four years, Britain has always been a reluctant follower in projects that have essentially been decided by the French and the Germans. And I completely agree with you. If our whole attitude had been from the mid-1970s that we were going to lead Europe rather than be dragged reluctantly along with the next European projects, then I think we would... Uh, could be, would, uh, London could have become, which is by vision, the capital of Europe, and we could have been the leading player. You know, just think, Ian, how wonderful it could have been. The, the, the a Bank of England could be the central bank of, of Europe. Uh, the single currency could be run from Threadneedle Street. The governor of the, of the European Central Bank could have been you. No, I mean, it could have no, been, you know, a leading silly. British politician, <laughs> instead of which it didn't happen. Now, the big and interesting question is whether it was never going to happen, because our traditions and our semi-detachedness from the continent, of course, doesn't start in the mid 70s this goes back centuries we are an island we have constantly been drawn into pan-european politics often in times of war in desperate situations like uh, 1939 but our instincts and is perfectly understandable as an island nation that hasn't been invaded externally since the 11th century since 1066 is to stay apart and that i think is going to be for uh, our generation and the generations to come afterwards. A genuine debate it is a genuine yeah. debate when you're on the uh, a very large and economically powerful and militarily powerful uh, state 
but on the edge of the continent on an island, how far do you engage? And in particular, when it's undoubtedly true, and I, I give this completely to, because this, this is, I think, part of the shared debate, we are a great democracy. I don't go along with these people who say it's all a bit of a sham and it's always being trash and all that. There aren't any other countries that have had a parliamentary tradition like ours going back essentially seven or eight centuries with a, a profound democratic tradition going back to the 19th century. My great hero is William Ewart Gladstone, who essentially paves the way for the first... Something else we have in common. And a brilliant guy <laughs> who paves the way for the first truly functioning democracy in Europe. And that is very valuable. And it, when people look at the continent and say, well, you know, they're sort of Johnny come late Liz, and it's yeah. all... There, there is a truth to this. These are, are difficult judgment calls. And I've never thought on this Brexit issue that the people on the other side were somehow... Uh, uh, badly motivated. These these are judgment calls as to how you see the best interests of the country. You, you mentioned the exchange rate mechanism. I, I have a bit of a theory that had we not joined the ERM in 1990 or 89, yeah, I can't the remember. Last year, that things might have been very different because I, I don't think that there was a mood in this country uh, against the European Economic Community or European Union in any meaningful way until Black Wednesday. And it, a lot of the Eurosceptic feelings, in fact, I think Nigel Farage has said this, that that was what radicalised him to go into politics, Black Wednesday. Um, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't have had Nigel Farage. Now, there were other things that mm -hmm. contributed to it, sort of all the immigration debate and under the Blair government, etc. But I think that was a crucial, crucial time. Definitely, because it was, uh, I think, for one overriding reason, there was a massive sense of British humiliation. Yes. Massive sense. And the one thing you don't do to great nations is humiliate them. Yeah. And uh, it's arguable we humiliated ourselves. I mean, we went in at too high a rate and it wasn't sustainable and all of that. Though I do think if you're looking back at the history, and history is always important to understanding the future, at the very end, do you remember the very end of the... ERM when Norman Lamont and Norman, and though I like him, is, is not somebody who I'm politically close to when he sought to renegotiate the ERM at the very end with the uh, German finance minister yeah. and got a complete brush off, I don't think that that was wise politics on the part of Germany uh, I think No, all the was, Bundesbank and yes. their behaviour actually on that day And I, I think the humiliation, and of course it was a personal humiliation for John Major as well, mm. it basically ended the Major Premiership well, that combined so with was, Maastricht. Yeah, I mean, that, those were the those two, two key things, but, but really. I, I, I do agree with that. I, I think if you look back at it further, of course, if we'd been in the ERM from the beginning, from when it started in the 1970s, when it was basically Roy Jenkins, Helmut Schmidt and Valerie Giscard d'Estaing, then I think we would have, been, would have been in a much stronger position to change our rate. Because you, you, you could have... I mean, this is getting a bit nerdy now, but you could realign your exchange rate within yeah. the ERM. That was the purpose of having these fixed but changeable exchange rates. The reason why we couldn't do it in 1992, which is what caused the crisis, is that we were a Johnny-come-lately. We'd only gone in two years before. So the, the, the Germans and the French, you can understand why they said, well, look, they've only just come in. They spent 15 years deciding whether they were going to come in, and now they already want to change. If we'd been in from the beginning, it might have been different. Mm. But the one thing you can't do about history is rerun it. No. That is what happened, and we're living with the consequences. Do you think... I mean, you and I, I think you're a year younger than me. We're roughly the same age. Do you think that either of us will live to see Britain rejoining the EU? Uh, I confidently expect that I will. But, you know, I'm an inveterate optimist. Indeed, somebody <laughs> once described me as a professional optimist. So, I mean, you know, as, as George Eliot famously said, the, uh, of all human failings, prophecy is the least excusable. So uh, there's no point prophesying. Do, do you not I, think... I, but I'm working the most campaigning for The it, most so. likely circumstance of us rejoining would be some sort of national humiliation. I think, that, well, I'm not sure about that. If you look at when Britain's come back in the past, it's often been because of a crisis on the continent. You know, Britain gets dragged uh, at lightning speed, literally, into Europe in 1938-39 because of, of Hitler and mm. uh, megalomania on the continent, which threatens not just Britain, but the whole of basically what we would regarded then as Western civilization. If you look at Europe at the moment, though, uh, fortunately, France and Germany are very stable, and that's been a huge, by the way, it's been a huge British success story. Why is it that France and Germany in 2021 are stable democracies? It's because of what Britain did in the 1940s, 1950s and 1960s. We should take it. I think we don't take enough credit for the whole trend of European politics. The idea that Germany 
75 years after the war is a stable democracy is a huge tribute to Britain, Ernie Bevin, the creation of NATO and so on in the 1940s. It's British policy as much as anything. But there's lots of sources of instability. I mean, Putin... You know, look what's going on there. Yeah. He's, he's got troops massed on the border of Ukraine. Uh, the eastern uh, boundary of, of NATO at the moment includes the three Baltic states, which could at any moment be swallowed up by uh, by Putin and whoever is Putin's successor in Russia. And there are big Russian minorities in those countries. Anyone who studied the 1930s and doesn't see echoes of it now uh, isn't, um, uh, isn't being realistic. And I think it's possible humiliation will push us in. But I think that's less likely because humiliated countries tend, in my experience, just to go into decline. I think what's much more likely to bring us in is the need for a much greater statement of solidarity on the part of Europe, which could be because of some external crisis like a, a Russian attack on the eastern flank of Europe. And we have a massive vested interest, just as we did in the 30s, in seeing that you don't have uh, have a, a profoundly, essentially fascist dictator trying to invade Europe from the east. And, of course, east of Putin is Xi. And if you look at what's happening in China at the moment, the... Uh, uh, the um, uh, in uh, with the Uyghurs and what's essentially a genocide, uh, with Xi, who's becoming a kind of Maoist megalomaniac. He looks a bit better and he wears a Western suit, but what's going on there? Look at what's going on in Hong Kong. Indeed, because life and politics is complicated, the most positive thing happening in Britain at the moment in terms of our economy, which might negate the short-term impact of Brexit, is the massive emigration of Hong Kong Chinese. Yeah. I think it's the best single decision, by the way, that Boris Johnson has taken, is giving sanctuary to the Hong Kong Chinese. But I thought it would be tens of thousands. Now that there are all these trials going on and locking up anybody who dares to express an independent opinion in Hong Kong, we could see several hundred thousand yeah. Hong Kong Chinese. And Nobody's I cannot, writing about this, though, are they? It's Nobody's a huge commenting issue. on it. But the great irony, and I would welcome it, I think it was a right decision, I think it would be absolutely brilliant for the economy. The great irony is, if the salvation of Britain against the short-term economic consequences of Brexit is mass immigration from Hong Kong Chinese, and one of the reasons why we did Brexit was to stop immigration from Eastern Europe, then life is complicated, isn't it? Well, I'm going to hit back on that one, because I don't think it was to stop immigration from Eastern Europe, it was to control it and actually to have a, a level playing field. So you, somebody from India could come in on exactly the same basis as someone from Poland, which, I mean, I didn't support Brexit for immigration reasons. I supported it predominantly for sovereignty reasons. And I think that is where, even today, people misunderstand the motivations for Brexit. And people people who say, well, I voted so, so, so we can take back control, they are ridiculed. And I don't think there's any reason for, to ridicule people who say that we, we are an independent nation and we need to set our own laws. And I, there's still this fundamental misunderstanding, just as there is a fundamental misunderstanding in the Labour Party as to why they lost the 2019 well, election. It wasn't just about Jeremy Corbyn. It yeah. wasn't just about Brexit. It went far deeper than that. But people nowadays seem to have to have some simplistic single reason for analysing why people voted one particular way. Yeah, well, look, I fully accept that there are a lot of reasons. Uh, Lord Salisbury, a great leader of the Conservative Party, famously said of general elections uh, that they're like the great oracle. The problem is when the great oracle speaks, no one's quite sure what the great <laughs> oracle said. And why do people vote as they do in general elections? What were the reasons why people voted for Brexit? The truth is that there were a lot of them and they overlapped. And, mm. you know, I fully accept that it wasn't just Jeremy Corbyn. Indeed, Jeremy Corbyn, to some extent, was the symptom rather than the problem. Why was the Labour Party in such a decrepit state by 2015 that it could elect Jeremy Corbyn as its leader? Somebody who I remember from the Blayers was regarded not just as a fringe figure, but as sort of barely functioning within the Labour Party at all. How could he, within eight years... Eight years of Blair leaving uh, Number 10 to become leader of the Labour Party. Clearly there was some is, kind of deep rot that had set in. Isn't that why is... politics is so wonderful? Why you and I mm. still remain addicted to it? Because you never know you never what's know. going to happen The next. Japanese have a proverb, which I love, about politics. In politics, an inch ahead is darkness. <laughs> and that's absolutely true, isn't it? I mean, who knows? I mean, how long is Boris Johnson going to survive for? Literally, you could get offers on that from next week to 10 years' time. Well, I, I've just is... done my New Year's predictions, yeah. and one of them was that he would still be Prime Minister at the end of 2022. And honestly, the, the mm. things that people have said, how can you possibly... You call yourself a serious no, political commentator, and you think, 
Well, an incumbent prime minister is in a very with, powerful with position. With a majority of 80. With a majority Kenza of 80. Said that to me. And uh, what are the latest polls showing? A narrowing of the gap, and yeah. the Tories are now only three points behind. An inch ahead is darkness. Well, we, we, we will see. Now, let's talk about how you got into politics. Um, wh when did the political bug first bite? Well, the, uh, when I was a teenager, I, I remember Hezo. Michael Hestown's a great hero of mine, even though he's sort of formally on the other side, but partly because of we've done so many things in common, particularly big infrastructure, you know, Liverpool, yeah. that kind of stuff. And when I launched my latest book uh, on, on leaders, he did the launch. And I said to him, how did you get into politics? And it was a story rather similar to mine. He started, you know, reading The Times and becoming really interested in what was going on in politics in his mid-teens. And then when he went up to university at the age of 18, the first thing he did was to get, in his case, involved in the University Conservative Association. In my case, it was the Oxford University SDP because Roy Jenkins, who was a great hero of mine, because I'd read all his history books, yeah. his biography of Asquith yeah. and so on, uh, he just set up the SDP and I, I regarded myself, as you said earlier, as, as, as a Jenkinsite. However, he said something very profound. He said, people often come up to me and say, I'm thinking of going into politics. And Michael said, I stop them dead immediately. If you're thinking of going into politics, you're not going to do politics. Politics is one of those things which is it's the only thing you want to do with your life or you don't do it. And when I was in my uh, late teens, early 20s, that was very much my view. The thing I wanted to do above all, I had this sort of very romantic, classical view of, you know, the Palace Westminster politics, big ideas and all of that, which, by the way, has never left me. But what then happened in... And I became a local councillor at the age of 22. I had this view that most people who get anywhere in politics get into elective politics. Either they get elected or, get, or mm. stand for election in their 20s. I was a councillor at 22, very active in I politics. I stood for the council at 22. So you, but, you qualify. But I, but I deliberately did it in some a seat that I knew I wouldn't win. But, but nonetheless, you, 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 you qualify. <laughs> I was just looking up Liz Trust recently, because somebody said to Were me earlier really? that Liz Trust might be the next leader of the Gazette. So I was looking her up. She first gets elected to the London Borough of Greenwich as a councillor. Guess what age? 30. Uh, Tony Blair, who, as you know, I think the, the sun shines out of his uh, yes. e every, uh, every part of his uh, anatomy. When does he get elected to the House of Commons? At the age of 30, first stands at the age of Because he wasn't at all interested in politics at university, but then, was he? But, but it does get into it in his 20s. Yeah. Joe Biden, elected to the Senate at the age of 30. Clinton before, so, so on. It's a remarkable uh, correlation. And that was true of me. But then it didn't work out because my party vanished. The SDP literally vanished after the 1987 election when I was... When I was um, uh, when I was in my in my twenties, and I then went off to be become a journalist. Actually, I suppose a bit like Boris Johnson. I spent ten years in serious journalism on the mm. FT and then the the Observer. But for me, journalism, I think a bit like for Boris, was politics by other means. Yeah, I was always well, very look at me uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, the, and it is the next thing. And indeed, politics and journalism literally are symbiotic, aren't they? They're, they're two yeah. sides of the same coin. But but because I uh, sort of true to a set of of, of beliefs and views. I didn't really do anything much in politics until Tony Blair became leader of the Conservative Party. What uh, I find Labour interesting Party, about so. that period is that you didn't do what Danny Finkelstein, Greg mm. Clark, um, several others, they didn't go from the SNP and join the Tories under John Major. Did you ever the think SDP, about it? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I did, I did think about it. Seriously, the, the, the person who persuaded me that the right thing to do was to sit and just do nothing for a while was Roy Jenkins because he said to me you're not a conservative which actually I'm not socially mm. uh, it's not that there aren't people who have similar views to me who are like Hezza who are part of the conservative party but I'm uh, in sort of in terms of my background I'm somebody who's who's got a profound sense of dramatic social change what I really want to do it, uh, this social mobility thing and social equity thing is in my inner being and I'm not saying you can't do that as a Conservative. It's harder to do it as a Conservative because not so many Conservatives have that sort of background. So I thought then that a modernised social democratic party was the place to be. So I basically did nothing in politics until Tony Blair came along. When Tony Blair came along, though, he was obviously my kind of, of guy. And when he succeeded in getting rid of Clause 4 of the Labour Constitution, which, you know, the old Clause 4 was essentially a Marxist Clause yeah. 4, ownership of the means, public ownership of the means of, of production and supply, which implied mass public ownership. And I had, that had always been a big obstacle to me because I don't believe in that at all. I don't even begin to, to believe in the state running the entire economy. When he changed Clause was for I thought this was for real and I said to Roy well what do I do and he said to me my dear Andrew he said uh, at your age he said now that there are two social democratic parties you should join the bigger one <laughs> and that's why I joined why the Labour Why do you party. think he never went back to Labour? Because he said you can't re-rat. Churchill did. 
Yeah, but he, I think, in his last book, his last big book was on Churchill. Mm. Also, he didn't see himself as having a future political career, whereas Churchill, of course, when Churchill re ratted, he was still in his 50s. Wouldn't he have been leader of the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords? Lords. He was, but he he wasn't doing a political career. I mean, this was basically a kind of almost honorific post. Mm. So it doesn't happen till his 70s. I think if he'd been 20 years younger, he would have joined the the Blair Labour Party. In fact, I'm pretty certain he would have. Because it's interesting at the moment, the, the. ex-Labour people who are going back to Labour under Keir Starmer. You've got Louise Ullman mm. uh, recently decided to, but most of the others, like Chukra Muna, I mean, none of them have. Well, most of those, of course, have left politics entirely. And one of my sort of uh, things about life is that success in life depends upon being present and keeping going and sticking at it. One of the things I've noticed in pretty well all of the jobs I've done, including politics, is a surprising number of people, including very able people, give up. And you're never quite sure, because this is a very personal thing, what it is that leads them to give up. Often it's things in their personal life. It's personal tragedies and traumas. Illness is a very big cause of people giving up. And um, a lot of people from... uh, Sometimes it's just straightforward pressure. And that 2017 to 19 Parliament was, as you know, Mm. extremely fraught. It put a lot of pressure on people. So why people give up, you're never quite sure. What you're sort of echoing is what Theodore Roosevelt used to say, that you have to be in In the the arena arena to affect things. Yes. And... Is that interesting? We had Luciana Berger on Cross Question a couple of weeks ago, and um, she was almost saying, "Well, of course, I'm not in politics anymore." And I'm thinking, "Yeah, but mm. you're on this program. You mm. still, you, you still want to have a mm. little bit of the adrenaline, don't you?" Yes, but also, it te- it, I think, to some extent, it depends on whether you've got a mission. When Labour lost in 2010. Uh, you know, after the Gordon Brown government where I'd been Transport Secretary and I'd been very, very active. I didn't see a mission and I didn't do much politics. I barely turned up at the House of Lords for the next five years after. And uh, I was, uh, I, I chaired a, an independent think tank, the Institute for Government. I did some commercial things. Uh, and then I didn't start getting back in again until George Osborne asked me as, uh, on a cross-party basis to mm. set up the National Infrastructure Commission. But I didn't see that as a political role. So I suppose to an extent I, I'd given up in politics. It was, it was what happened in 20. 16. And it was two things, actually. It was a combination of Brexit plus the sudden realisation that my party, the Labour Party, was literally going down the plug hole. I mean, literally, I sort of woke up to the fact that with Corbyn as leader and all that, and I felt, hey, somebody's got to do something about it. And when no one else is doing it, there's a bit of responsibility to step up. Um, We'll go back to Tony Blair in just a moment, in case you think I'm not going to. Um, You, on social media... You were quite manic on social media over Active, Brexit, weren't you? Active, not manic. Well, Alistair, I, uh, I remember Alistair Campbell saying to me once that he felt that he'd almost become possessed. And that I think that translated onto his social media presence. And I kind of thought of you in the same way, in that you were so out there, so socking it to people. That, do you think that you did go over the top a little no, bit? No, I don't. But these are... Because you're always in the trade of politics having to innovate if you're going to be successful mm. all successful people in politics are, are innovators what was very clear to me when i sort of looked at it because i took a long cool look before i sort of uh, uh, got going on social media seriously in 2016 is that it was very clear to me because i'd never done social media before at all i mean yeah. the idea as a as a blair and brown minister i would have been <laughs> tweeting i don't think i heard of twitter till 2012 or 2013 was for the birds i have always taken this view that when you're in politics you should do it really professionally and it was very clear to me in 2016-17 that social media was the cut edge. I was also very struck though by the fact that social media was the cutting edge but very very few politicians were doing it. Very few. I mean you were doing it. You were active. You said mentioned Alistair. Not many. I think there were only three or four MPs who were doing it seriously and I most members of the House of Lords and I mentioned Twitter to them. You know they thought I was talking about a bird table or something. I mean it was so far removed and I thought well you've got to do this and it was also clear to me because you're in your whatever it is whatever it is 160 characters and all of that that you have got to have a very out there persona to do Twitter so the view I took was that I needed a Twitter personality and Roy Jenkins always said to me because I, I he's imagine my great Roy mentor. Jenkins on Twitter <laughs> no but Roy Jenkins said to me the only thing in politics worse than having a strong personality is not having one yeah and so it was clear to me that if I was going to be able to use social media for this great cause which was you know trying to project myself as uh, as, as a serious leader in this European debate and, and also in the Labour Party that I needed to have a Twitter personality now I'm not pretending I got it completely right you may be right. Maybe I was too OTT. The only thing I would say is that the only thing worse than having a strong 
Twitter personality was not having one. And I did but manage did... to cut through. I was struck by how many media things I was doing, including, yeah. you know, being invited onto big programmes, like, which all came out yeah. of what I'd been doing no, that on is Twitter. that is true. But so did, maybe did you succeeded. deliberately what, try to wind the opposite side yes, up? Yes, definitely. <laughs> oh, I, I started man-marking Farage. Deliberately. Oh, yeah, I knew what I was doing. The thing about, about politics, if you're doing it very seriously, is that it's a much more... Uh, and Tony Blair used to say this to me. It's a much more intellectual exercise than people think. Not in the sense that intellectuals are necessarily very good at it or that you should, you know, do it with footnotes and things like that. You need to keep it bold and simple. But you have got to think through very carefully what you're doing. And you've always got to have a plan. You know, you've always, always in politics, if you're going to be successful, got to have a plan for the future. It, you, sometimes it's like the sat nav, you need to change it and so on, but you've got to have a plan. The Twitter thing and the social media thing I did was according to a plan. It didn't necessarily go, I mean, the plan wasn't necessarily a perfect plan, but in terms of being able to project myself in a new way, I think it was the right thing. And I do absolutely think that democracy requires politicians to engage with the people. And one of the main ways that you do engage now as a politician, is social media. And I think, therefore, it's absolutely do, right do you not think, that politicians though, that do that. Do you not think, Twitter, in some ways, it has been a fantastic democratising force in that it's allowed people a voice mm. who never had one before? But it's also been a very destructive force in terms of not just all the abuse that people get, but also almost destroying rational debate because you have to do it in 280 characters. And how can you, how can you articulate a nuanced position... Mm. in 280 characters. The answer is you can't. <clears throat> well, I don't actually agree with that, because though it's true that the tweets themselves are short, a large part of what you do if you do Twitter successfully, in my view, is how you cross-refer between what you do on Twitter and what you do in other media. Now, you and I are very rare beings, Ian, in that we write books. I mean, whole books. You know, I mean, you, you seem to be able to produce one a year, and I, I work hard at doing yeah, that. Yeah, but the and secret, Andrew, is you get other people to write them. Well, you just but you, edit you, them. But you, nonetheless, you do, you do still <laughs> well, produce. I've written the odd one as yeah, well. Yeah. And one of the things I've sought to do, and I, I believe profoundly in, in long arguments, I do believe in that. You know, I, I make long arguments. Uh, I do a weekly column in Prospect. The Prospect is about as highbrow as you can get, Prospect magazine. And what I think one of the forms of doing politics that's going to be successful in the future is how you join together the long arguments yep. with the uh, oh, necessarily oversimplified way of presenting them. And, and I'm not saying I've got that right. I, I, you know, I think you may be right that I was too OTT on Twitter. All I would say is that I was at least wrestling and still am wrestling with what I think is the big challenge of modern politics and democracy, which is how do you at one and the same time make it really accessible to people, particularly the young who, who, who aren't, aren't engaged enough, whilst not... Um, dumbing down the arguments. And what I've always sought to do, I've never sought to dumb down my arguments. If you read my longer pieces, I wrote a whole book uh, with Will Hutton uh, called Saving Britain, which in, uh, in 60,000 words, not 180 characters, set out the argument for Britain to stay in the European Union. But then, in terms of getting it out there, making the arguments, doing the tactical debating day by day, taking on Nigel Farage, there's also Twitter. It's how you put those things together that I think is the art of modern politics. Whenever you come on my programme, I get people saying, ask him why he's blocked me on Twitter. I didn't say anything offensive, I've just disagreed with him. Um, you do seem to block an awful lot yeah, of people. Yeah, but people misunderstand why I block people. It's quite interesting, this. I do, but not because I'm in any way wanting to be rude to them, but because every time I turn on my Twitter feed, I don't want to be faced with, because it's just too time-consuming, with with large numbers of abusive tweets, which I then have to scroll through. So but these people are saying, well, I haven't sent an abusive tweet. Well, they have all those. I, I don't block people unless they've, they've said they've sent, sent me abusive tweets. No, because you see, and they misunderstand. They think that what I do on Twitter is want to engage in debates. I do very occasionally engage in debates, but only with, with people who I particularly want to, like Nigel Farage and all that. I regard Twitter as a means of broadcasting, not a means oh, so of debating. You, so you don't want to engage with the plebs? No, that's not the case at all. No, I <laughs> well, do. I, kind I, of what you I, were I, saying. No, no I, I, I engage all the time, but I don't see Twitter as a means, you know, person by person. And a lot of these people, by the way, are anonymous on Twitter. Yeah. And I strongly object to abuse, some of it, because I've had my share of... of 
of really serious threats on Twitter, and they, uh, you know, really serious abuse mm. going way over the line. You know, some of which has gone to the police. Mostly that comes uh, from anonymous accounts, and most of, not all, but most of the of of the of the people I block are anonymous, and they say things which are really outrageous that I don't believe they would say if they had to put their name to no. it. So th those are some, some some of the reasons. But I don't do it as a, uh, because I want to be rude, but just because life is short, I turn the, the iPhone on, and I don't want to spend the next 10 minutes just looking at a whole chain of Cause, abuse. Because there are tweets that... I mean, sometimes... You, I mean, you say you are deliberately provocative sometimes, and I find that there are some tweets I send where I know there's going to be a big reaction... Mm. And it means that you can't actually look at your Twitter feed for two days because it's it's just mm. full of people mm. either... I don't mind if they disagree, but it's when they deliberately misinterpret something that you've said for their own ends. And But I, I probably engage a bit more than I should. But, but often, you reply. I have, often, yeah. Well, I do. Mm. Oft, often you find, though, that you can have quite a robust debate with someone and then at the end of it they'll say... Well, thank you for responding because I didn't think that someone like you would speak to someone like me. And I thought, well, I, I do. Yeah. But I also, people say to me, why don't you mute people rather than block? Then they're just whistling in the wind. I said, no, if I block someone, it's because I want them to know that I've blocked them. Well, that that is, a, a, I mean, we're now into the weeds of Twitter. <laughs> yes, we are. I, I, it may we'll be, move on in it, a second. It may be that you're right, that muting rather than yeah. the blocking. It's a, yeah. um, can you remember the first time you met Tony Blair? Uh, uh, yes, I can uh, absolutely because I was an FT journalist, and he was his first, uh, well, his second shadow cabinet job actually. His first shadow cabinet job was shadow energy secretary. His second shadow cabinet job was was shadow employment secretary, and I was employment and education correspondent on the FT. This would be 1990, and um, and he was absolutely brilliant. This is when Tony was doing his first big defining mm. um, battle actually, which is on the closed shop. And that's when he first came to my notice, because um, uh, it's amazing to think, going back a generation ago, that for uh, th thanks to m legislation from Michael Foote in the 1970s, there were industries where if you didn't belong to a trade union, you were not allowed to hold a job. Yep. Now, my view was that this is what brought the whole of the left into disrepute. This was a kind of totalitarianism of the left. I mean, people complain about totalitarianism of the right, but this is its own own form. And that was one of the things, because, you know, why did Margaret Thatcher come to power in 1979 and it takes so long for the Labour Party to come back? Because of this sense of overweening trade union power. And it had to be tackled. And Tony Blair understood that. And when I was on the FT and I saw him very courageously taking on this battle against the closed shop, I thought, wow, this is a, a Labour leader who's got something about them. He's making the argument for employment rights and trade, union, trade unionism on the basis of fairness, not on the basis of brute force. And... Um, I got talking to him then because, of course, he was very keen to engage, particularly with the FT, because he understood that yeah. if he'd get the FT on side, then there was a whole constituency that Labour wasn't speaking to, which uh, might become favourable. And ever since, uh, ever since that moment, I thought he had something about him because he was brave and courageous in making arguments which were absolutely essential for the modernisation of the country. And that's always been my view of, of Tony ever since. And when did you first start working for him? I didn't work for him until 1998, a year into the Labour government. I, I was doing some work writing speeches for him and stuff like that while I was a journalist, uh, a bit like some, you know, Conservative people are quite close to, you know, leading Conservative politicians. And I was doing that from the mid-90s. But mid -90s. you were still involved in politics, so didn't you get selected as a Lib Dem candidate I did, somewhere? I which was slightly inconvenient because this was just <laughs> the time when Tony Blair became leader of the, of, the, of the Labour Party. And it took me extricating myself from that when Roy Jenkins told me it was now time for me to join the mm. Labour Party. Party. That was a slightly uh, fraught proceedings, but um, but I didn't actually work for him until uh, at the end of the his first year uh, in government, and then I worked for him all the way through. How did that come about? Uh, he asked me to work for him, right. and you know when prime ministers ask you to do things, you tend not to say no. So that that's how it happened. You reckon? <laughs> uh, but I, by then I was very keen to work for him, and I I was sending him quite regular. And David Miliband is a great friend of mine, who was his first policy director quite regular notes on what I thought the government should be doing after 1907. I thought it wasn't moving fast enough on public service reform, particularly on education, mm -hmm. which is my great passion. Uh, the first term of that Labour government was doing good stuff on primary schools. Do you remember the national literacy strategy, smaller class sizes and all that? But it was very, very clear to me, until Labour started reforming the comprehensive school and making it universally a successful model of secondary education, whereas too often it was a failing model of secondary education, Labour wouldn't be taken seriously on education. And I was saying this... 
uh, to um, Tony Blair and David Miliband from day one of the 1997 Labour government. And then a year into the government, Tony said, do you think you could come on and help us do it? And uh, that's when the next chapter of my life started. So you went to work in the policy unit covering education. Yeah. Yeah. And then you then you become became head of the policy. When, when unit. David went into yeah. the House of Commons in, 19, in 2001, yeah. And I mean that's that's a pretty powerful position, mm. or certainly an influential mm. position, isn't it? If if you've got the right person and the right prime minister, was he receptive to radical ideas? Hugely, hugely receptive. I mean, if you think about what that government did, we introduced uh, university t- tuition fees in a, in a, in the biggest reform of university finances that there's been. Um, uh, well, s- since the Robbins report, really, since the, the creation of a, of a mass university system um, uh, 60 years ago, uh, we uh, transformed uh, 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 the education um, system. Not to my mind uh, enough. We did a really good job in London, where it, it was it was completely transformed. It was only partially changed elsewhere, and I think that's part of the reason. By the way, because you wanted to make academisation uh, compulsory, didn't well, you? No, I wanted it to spread across all weak and failing schools, not compulsory for all schools. The truth is that that the the my academy model, which was of completely uh, refounding with new leadership, new buildings, and everything, failing comprehensive schools in areas of disadvantage, that was really successful in London because we got to critical mass. We didn't get to critical mass in the other big cities. And as I look back, you've always got to be reproachful and um, honest about uh, legacy. Part of the reason why I think we had this big uh, problem in the 2010s in what's now called the Red Wall is that though Labour put a, a lot of funding into public services, and rightly so, it trebled health spending, doubled education spending in the new Labour years, we weren't sufficiently transformational in the reforms outside London. And if we'd been able to do in Manchester, Leeds, Sheffield, Newcastle, Liverpool, if we'd been able to get the the, the change in the standards in the schools and the, the performance of the public services that we got in London, then I think we might have been able to stop. But why not? What because after they were all Labour authorities. Well, can I let you into a secret? Some of the most difficult... Uh, areas to deal with were, were those with, with, with Labour authorities. It wasn't university true. There were a lot of Labour authorities in London too. The difference is, and this is, is something that's always important in politics, is I think um, competition is a very good thing. The reason why, because I was dealing, because London, the, the secondary school system in London between 2000 and 2010 was completely reinvented uh, to a degree that, as people look back on it, is truly amazing. You know, one of the most successful uh, secondary schools in the country is Mossbourne Academy, which is, you know, now the flagship for, you know, sort of 30 that go to Oxford and Cambridge, 100 that go to Russell Group University, all that. That is on the site of Hackney Downs School that was the worst failing school in the country in the 1990s, mm. closed by the John Major government because it was literally out of control. The story of London is a phenomenal story, but the reason why it was possible to get local authorities, both Labour and Conservative in London, to play ball is that the London uh, uh, political system is, is very competitive. As you saw at the mayoral level, you know, uh, Ken Livingstone was defeated by Boris Johnson, who was, and then the Conservatives went out to Labour in, in 2016. Part of the problem with, with these other cities, it's a problem in reverse, I think, in some areas where you, where you just have uni- universal Conservative governments is that people become very complacent when yeah. there isn't competition. I live in Tunbridge Wilds, but, I know. Exactly. But the great <laughs> irony is most of these places now where I couldn't get big reforms through to the public services because they were essentially one party Labour states. Look at what's happened to the Red Wall since. And the, the, the problem there, there is, I mean, I've, I've, I'm always against um, any form of PR for Westminster elections, but I would consider it for local, local elections local, to, local. For, that one, mm. for that reason. Also, because I think that these local councils, where they've got a one-party majority, tend to become quite corrupt as well. But if you had proportional representation in all these cities, um, and indeed rural areas, I'm not sure that would actually lead to any more radical policies would it? Because you would have to get maybe three parties to agree to something. I don't, the, the truth is, everything depends upon leaders, is my view. So the question is, would a, 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 a more proportional electoral system starting locally lead to um, uh, more better leaders coming through? And there's one good reason for thinking it would. That if you had PR, <clears throat> and therefore more than one party was uh, was involved, you have more than one leader 
Mm. I was very struck in the last German election, and the German electoral system, by the way, we invented. Let's be clear, it was it's yeah. a deliberate hybrid between first past the post, which was the British system, and PR, which was the Weimar Republic system. And what Ernie Bevin, my great hero, did when they were doing the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1949, because they wanted to, to keep the best of both worlds, having constituencies and parties able, you know, larger parties being overrepresented, but having a proportional top up. They put the two together, and if you had a system like that. What I think you'd end up with is, is more potential leaders because where you've got more than one party in competition, say in Tunbridge Wells you had PR, there would be more than one party that's in competition and therefore there would also be more than one leader in competition, whereas mm. I don't know Tunbridge Wells well, but I imagine the only leader that matters is the leader of the Conservative group. Not only council, more, because they've just so. lost their majority. But Have that's a, that's another story. Well, so may, maybe things <laughs> ultimately, one party states ultimately do produce their antithesis. Yeah. But the problem is, it takes quite a long time. Isn't it? Interesting, your heroes, Roy Jenkins. Michael Heseltine, Tony Blair and Ernie Bevan. I wonder how mm. Tony Blair and Ernie Bevan would have got on. Oh, very well. But because, I mean, chalk and cheese in many ways. No, but but they were like uh, Tony Blair and John Prescott. They were. Did they get on that well? Uh, it was a working partnership working partnership. And, and Ernie Bevin, who was a man of power, was brilliant at partnerships. This is the guy who had the closest possible partnership with Churchill in the Second World War. He was as Minister of Labour. Mm. You know, Ernie Bevin essentially gets the home front moving while Churchill is, is doing all the grand strategy with, with the Americans and then in due course the Russians. It was that partnership which was great. And part of the reason why it worked so well is that Ernie knew that even though he was a very dominant personality himself, uh, that it's partnerships that matter in politics. And he also had a brilliant partnership with Clem Attlee. And you couldn't have had two people who were more, yeah. using your words, chalk and cheese. Clem Attlee, you know, was almost a mouse-like figure, which Ernie Bevin certainly wasn't. But Bevin uh, stuck close to Clem Attlee all the way through that 1945 Labour government. There were repeated attempts to remove Attlee, you had Cripps, you had Morrison, you had all these people who were constantly launching coups. The reason why Attlee is Prime Minister all the way through from 1945 to 1951 is every time there's an attempt to remove Attlee, Ernie Bevin comes along and literally crushes it. So he was brilliant at working in partnership, and I think an Ernie Bevin-Tony Blair partnership would have been so powerful we would have been able even to reform those schools in the north of England. But the Gordon Brown Tony Blair partnership should have been that powerful, shouldn't it? And in some ways it, it was, was. Yeah. but it was also very destructive. Well, the, the different, the, the big difference, and by the way, uh, I, I was one of Gordon's ministers, yeah. and I have a huge regard for him, and it was always my view in that government, and as I'm now Tony Blair's biographer, so I'm thinking about this a lot, that it was absolutely right that Tony stuck with Gordon all the way through, because it was the it was the combination of the two that was the the the, the, the solidity of that new Labour government. The big difference, though, between Tony and Gordon and Clem Attlee and indeed Churchill and Ernie Bevin is that Ernie always believed he should be the number two figure. He thought, actually, because of all his dropped H's, how he was going to play in Middle England and, and not having gone to university, mm. his view, but he was very, very self-aware, was that though he had many great qualities and was a stalwart for any government, and he actually believed his vision was stronger often than the leaders. He was at variance with Churchill and with Attlee on, on many big things. But he never believed that he had the wherewithal to be the person who should front a British government. He had a strong sense of what it took to front a British government, and it was a Churchill or an Attlee who was a university man and so on. The difference with Tony and Gordon, and this is just the reality of power, is that after the first few years, Gordon thought, he was as good as Tony, and he should become the number one. And the problem in I think politics... think all along. Yeah, well, maybe from the beginning. But the problem in politics is that only one person can be the leader. Mm. You can't have two. And the thing that was constantly nagging in the, in the New Labour years was that, as that Gordon thought he should be the number one. Now, having said that, they did, it did work. And there's actually nothing it, wrong with it, that. It didn't, I mean, there's it nothing permanent. wrong with ambition in politics. But when it becomes destructive, which it did, I would say... After 2003, it really did... Be and I, I suppose I base that view on my reading of Alastair Campbell's diaries, which um, I just think is the most magnificent piece of work, sort of the, mm. right from 1994 right to the end and beyond. Um, you, you see some of the meetings that took place, some of the things that were said. I mean, 
things that you just wouldn't think that allies would say about each other. Well, I'm not sure it's much different to what uh, Theresa May and Boris Johnson were saying to each other in, <laughs> in 2017. Well, that was, I think it was a little or, different. But so, uh, they, you know, they, they, they were never they, political soulmates. Yeah. Were no, they? Relations at the top are, are, are often very, very difficult in politics, as, it, as in life. I mean, you know, I, I, you, you know, I've been involved in journalism. Some of the mm. relations between people at the top of newspapers are, Surely are pretty not. acid. And, not, not in broadcasting. Obviously, well, I'm it's sure all it's sweetness all and light. But so, yes. so this is a constant factor. The question is, is, is does it work or not? And even in that period, 2003 to 2000, when you're absolutely right, it was fought. I mean, literally, there were often meetings where they basically yeah. just were like ships passing in the night and all that. There was the 2005 election, which Labour won. And I think a good part of the reason why Labour won it was because so far as the public, what the public saw, which was the Blair-Brown partnership, that they saw as the solid rock of the previous 10 years, that's what they saw, and they liked that. Mm. And so when Tony, people often say you know, to me, who are the new Labour people at the time, Tony should have sacked Gordon, and some of the, talk, the Gordon people think he should have resigned on Tony. Actually, what they both constantly did in that period was they just drew back. And the reason they drew back is both of them had a very, very strong instinctive sense, partly because of their sense of public service, which was very strong with both of them, that in the situation they were in, they needed to make it work. And it wasn't until a few months before Tony went in 2007 that, that Gordon really moved to say, I don't think this can continue. And by then, 2006, when Tony had been Prime Minister for nine years, that might have been correct. Now, you became a minister in 2005. Um, often people who've been in the shadows of policy work or communications work sometimes don't adapt to actually holding the reins of power. Now, you were Minister of State at Education and then Transport, and then you became Secretary of State after, was it after the 2000... In, in 2009, 2009. the last year of the Labour government, yeah. Um, what were the challenges that you faced I mean, in, in making yeah. that transition? Well, exactly the challenge you've just said, which is having been a backroom boy, you know, an advisor, in the shadows for the previous uh, 10 years and having been a journalist for the 10 years before that, suddenly coming blinking into the limelight. In my experience, most people making that transition, they don't survive it. Mm. And for me, it was very tough. I'm not going to minimise it at all. It was very tough partly because I hadn't been doing it uh, professionally before, but also, of course, I was in the House of Lords. Yeah. And whatever else you say about the House of Lords, it is not the uh, the cockpit of the nation in terms of the, the political battle. And I felt very strongly the problem of being in the Lords rather than in the Commons. And do you know why it was I think I was able to hack it as I look back on it? It's that in my 20s, I had been elected. I'd been a member of Oxford City Council. I'd fought elections. I did debates. I was on the media all the time. And though it was, in a, as it were, a cocoon of Oxford, all the things I then had to do at the national level, in the dim recesses of my mind and my reflex and my personality I had there, my view is that if I'd never held elected office and hadn't been... Uh, I was a parliamentary candidate in my 20s as well and hadn't gone through that experience, if I had literally just done journalism and backroom stuff, I don't think I would have been able to make the transition. And as I look back and I say this to young people, and there'll be people watching this podcast, what should I do in my 20s if I, if I really do want to do politics? My advice to them all the time is seek to become a local councillor because local politics, which is elected politics, you have to run for elections, you know, you have to debate, you have to form policy, you have to run councils and all that, is in microcosm all of the stuff you have to do nationally. And that experience was absolutely uh, vital for me going into national politics in, in my 40s. When you joined the Cabinet, were, were you expecting Gordon Brown to ask you to join the Cabinet? No. Was it a surprise? To I was totally astonished. And actually, it was because uh, there's a, a big element... Because he must have known of your reverence for Tony Blair. Yeah, but, uh, but though actually, <laughs> I think that was part of the reason why it happened. Because what, right. what Gordon was keen to do was to have a balanced team. Uh, Tony would never have put me in the Cabinet... To have put one of his, you know... Well, he put Peter Mandelson in. Yeah, but, but Peter was, was a big established politician who'd been in the House of Commons and so on. Whereas for me, who'd been his, you know, his backroom advisor and was in the House of Lords and mm. never been elected to the House of Commons, I think for Tony to have done that, you know, I mean, can you imagine the, the backlash there would have been, particularly from Gordon Brown's people? Whereas for Gordon to do it, which he said was flatteringly recognising talent from another part of the party, made it possible. But there's always a big element of, of chance in politics, and I'd never expected it would happen for, for this reason, that um, we were in 2009, I'd only been Minister of State, the number two uh, figure in the Transport Department, for nine months, and Jeff Hoon, who was 
Secretary of State there. I'd also only been Secretary of State for nine months. So it hadn't crossed my mind that there would be a change. But then there was, uh, I even forget what the details were, there was uh, some controversy which engulfed Jeff, which at very short notice, like at two or three days' notice, led to a change. And so completely unexpectedly, I became I became Transport Secretary, I think partly because I was the number two in the department. And... Um, and Gordon, you know, partly because of what I was saying earlier about wanting a, a, somebody who was seen as a successful minister for another part of the party, appointed me. So as I look back on it, I was extremely lucky. I was extremely lucky that Gordon was prime minister and uh, who could have foreseen that, uh, that that my boss would suddenly go under a bus. Well, there was... The, the last election was in 2005, so you knew there'd be an election in 2010. Did you think to yourself, well... I've got a limited shelf life yes, as uh, transport minister, definitely. so I'm going to concentrate on one thing yes, or HS2, two things. Yeah, exactly. From the beginning. Exactly. I, and I published the plan for HS2 six weeks before the 2010 election. Now, there was a huge amount of work that went into it. It was not half-baked. Indeed, it stood the test of time. The HS2 that is being built today, after four changes of prime minister since, is, to all intents and purposes the HS2 plan that was published in 2010. I got a really brilliant team, including, I think, the best transport engineer in the country who did all of the route planning for it. So I went to see David Cameron privately. I've always had this great belief that you can't do big infrastructure unless it's cross-party. Uh, six months before the election, I showed him all the maps and everything. I said, this is only going to work if, you, if you're if you prepared to support it. And crucially, he and, and George Osborne didn't rule it out. They didn't say they supported it in the 2010 election, but they didn't say they opposed it either. Mm. And I think that's because of the work that I'd done with them behind the scenes. But it was very close run, and I was only just able to get it done before the 2010 election. The reason I was so keen to get it through was because it was patently obvious Labour was going to lose that election. There is a great irony, though, which is that the Chancellor then, Alistair Darling, who was a great friend of mine, I like Alistair a lot, but he was, how can I put it this way, he was not a big spender. <laughs> And he was certainly not a believer in big infrastructure. He'd been transport secretary. He thought big infrastructure projects always go wrong. His view was you should do the little stuff, not the big stuff. So when I went to him, and of course, it's always a problem with people who've held jobs you've held, is that you think they think they know everything. I said, look, Alistair, I've got this plan for this high-speed line, you know, the biggest project imaginable between London, Birmingham and Manchester. I'm not, I'm not sure you're going to like it, but a lot of work's been done. And he said, I know, he said, my officials have been telling me, he said, you can go ahead with it in the manifesto. Andrew, because it's never going to see the light of day. Ah. <laughs> eleven well, years, eleven years later, there are two hundred and fifty building sites between here and Birmingham, and it happens. And I'm hugely thankful to Alistair because he is the one person on my own side who could have killed it stone dead, mm. and he didn't. Yeah, because chancellors do have that power. Absolutely. Don't they? Do. Um, so the election comes and goes. Uh, then there's this five day period after the election where the coalition negotiations take place. And you were on the Labour team. Did you ever seriously believe that there was a chance that there could be a Lib Lab coalition? Not a coalition, no. I didn't think there would be a Lib Lab coalition. I did think that the best interests of the Lib, Lib Dems as a party were to, to let the Conservatives take office as a minority. And I still think that, in retrospect, as you look at the record of that government, I think it was a big mistake for them to form a coalition with the Conservatives. What they should have done was let David Cameron become Prime Minister, decide issue by issue what were the line they were going to take. There would have been another election in a year or two's time. Now, at the time, so I remember discussing this with Nick Clegg, he said, but we'll get eaten alive in that election. And I said, well, you're definitely going to get eaten alive in a coalition because you're a very small party with a very big one. And that always ends badly in coalitions. Coalitions of parties that are more equal in size can work, but it clearly wasn't going to work in that basis. And, uh, it, you know, I don't like to say I, I said so, but the, there hasn't been an example of a, of a party that has proportionately lost more seats mm. in British parliamentary no, history I totally, than the Lib Dems between 2010 totally and 2015. Agree. I'm trying to think back to that week. And I remember... Um, I mean, I think I was permanently on College Green alongside Alastair Campbell during that time because I was, I hadn't fought a seat in that election, but all of the candidates who had and all of the MPs on the Conservative side were told not to talk to the media. So, of course, the media go to the people they think mm. are sort of Conservative pundits. And I can remember thinking, this has to be a full coalition because if you remember the state of the financial markets at mm. the time... And the, I think the Greek financial crisis was in, in full swing then as well. Um, it just seemed to be the obvious thing to do. And you, you say that they were digging their own political grave, and you, you are right in that. 
I don't think they had any alternative. And, and when you think that they implemented 75% of their own manifesto in that five-year period, and I think they actually held a huge amount of sway over that government, far proportionally more than they probably ought to have done. Well, I, I, I don't think I share that analysis because the big thing for which that government was remembered, which is what really did them in in 2015, was austerity. It was a big cutback in the rate of increase in public spending. Now, you may say that was the right thing for the country, and there's no point us debating that here, but it was absolutely the wrong thing for the Lib Dems to be the instrument of it. And they would have done much better to have stayed out. And, of course, the thing that completely eviscerated them was voting for the trebling of tuition fees, the trebling. And this was a party which, in 2010 at the heart of their manifesto had been abolishing tuition fees entirely. Mm. They were to the left of me in 2010. There was me and Labour fighting to maintain £3,000 tuition fees. We had the Liberals who were proposing to abolish them entirely. And then they go into a coalition with the Conservatives, the first big step of which is to treble them. Now, that clearly wasn't going to work for them politically. And if they'd let the Tories take office in a minority, they obviously would have voted against yeah. an increase in tuition fees. And that alone, I think, would have saved them 20 or 30 seats in university cities and so on. And if you look at it comparatively, it's true that, of course, the right thing for the Conservatives was a coalition because they wanted stability and they were coming in from outside and they didn't have a majority. But there's a long tradition in Britain of minority governments. And what the Liberals, I think, should have said is that, look, you're the largest party and I think there's always... Um, uh, a default that the largest party should form the government. So you have a right to form a government. We're not going to pull the plug on it uh, immediately, but uh, equally, uh, we're going to take it issue by issue. And I think people will accept that there's probably going to be another general election in, in another year or two. Let's talk about your childhood. It's a fascinating story. Um, your father was a Greek Cypriot. Uh, you, I think... Did you come here? He came he here ca at the he, age he of came three. Here. Yeah. No, he Just he, tell he, us the story. He, he, my, my dad came over in the, at the age of 19. There's a, a huge wave of, of Cypriot immigration. The great irony is that the reason why so many Cypriots come to England, and particularly London, is because they're escaping from British imperialism in Cyprus. There is a literal war taking place in Cyprus in the 1950s for independence. Cyprus is a British colony. Mm. And what happens, there's, it's quite... It's quite horrible what's happening there's internments of villages all this kind of stuff it's it's pretty grim what's happening and what happens is a lot of the parents are desperate to get their kids out understandably because it's all uh, as i say uh, very grim when they've got them out where is it that they sent them all to well, the, <laughs> they all had british passports the only place you could send them to which was london so there was a mass exodus of, of cypriots from cyprus to um uh, to london uh, which is now a very large diaspora you know, yeah. we're talking about half a million. And, and by the way, you know, talk about immigration being great. This is a hugely successful, um, uh, a hugely successful uh, ethnic group in London. And we're all very proud of what we, we regard ourselves as Cypriots and British. You know, it's, it's a real success story. But that's what brings him here. And uh, uh, because in, in his case, because a lot, a, lot, a lot of his family go back. Rather tragically, they go back, and because my family comes from Famagusta, which is in the north of Cyprus, this is they then end up coming back as refugees in equally dreadful circumstances 15 years later when the Turks yeah. invade the north of the island. Whereas fortunately for him, my dad ends up staying, partly because he has two kids in, in, in rapid succession, which I don't think he'd expected, but also partly because he gets a job. He becomes a postman, which is regarded as a secure job. And he's a postman in the Hampstead sorting office for 35 years. So he stays, and his first child is me, and um, the rest is history for me. And I read that your your mother abandoned you after when you were three years old. Yeah, and I end up in a children's home. and um, uh, But I end up in a children's home, but I still see my dad. I see him every weekend or two. Because right. uh, he couldn't, because he's working every hour God sends, and uh, he can't he can't look after, after us. And people say, isn't that all... Um, uh, really, really tough. And at one level, it is. I mean, I, I, nobody wants to go into a children's home for who, in, in, unless there's some other option. More of the kids in my children's home ended up in jail than went to university. And I think it's probably true that a majority of the kids in my children's home are, are now dead. So it, it's definitely tough. But I, I don't look at my background and say, oh, is, wasn't it at all... Um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, but there must have been something a, that there must have been at the time when what, maybe not at the age of three, but certainly as you grew older, 
thinking, well, why why am I here? Well, I, I see my yeah. dad occasionally and all the rest of it, but there must have been some sort of self-analysis there, thinking, well, what, why has this happened to me? Well, I, I sort of understood why it was happening. And the thing about kids is they're very adaptable, provided they have the means of adapting. This is the crucial thing. They're very adaptable. And because you sort of think that what's happening around you is normal. And the, 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 the thing that makes the difference in success and failure is having a, me, a means to adapt and to succeed. And the reason, so as I was fishing for the words just a moment ago, the reason why I don't think that my background was unfortunate, I mean, it was definitely challenging, but I don't look back on it and think I had a terrible childhood. On the contrary, all of the skills of adaptability, survival, really hard work, getting on at school, I was really lucky that uh, I, I went to some fantastic schools. I had two outstandingly brilliant head teachers who spotted the fact that I was seriously academic, what, because of one of them I got into Oxford. So I look back at my childhood and think that if you give kids the right opportunity, you know, I'm, I'm a, one of my great um, uh, uh, mottos is those words of R.H. Tawney, the socialist philosopher, what the wise parent would wish for their child, so the state should wish for all children. And I was very lucky. The state was, in a sense, my, my parent and my guardian. I was in the care of the state. But my experiences with the state were, by and large, fortunate, an absolutely brilliant manager of my children's home who became a surrogate mother. A school I went to that was a kind of tough 1970s boarding school, but nonetheless two successive head teachers who were brilliant, one of whom got me into Oxford. Well, I mean, you can't do better than that, can you? And I will take no lectures from anybody about the, you know, people can't get on in this country and all that. You can absolutely get on. What you do if you're in politics have a duty to do is never, ever to pull up the drawbridge. We should do our absolute utmost to see that the next generation have the opportunities and more that we had and more. And that's part of the reason why education has been such a big part of my life in politics. What do you know about your mother? O almost nothing except that when I became a minister and the Daily Mail very kindly put an investigative team of eight to find out everything about my life, they tracked her down. And uh, uh, they interviewed her and she said all kinds of things, but she never contacted me afterwards, so I've never had any contact. Have you tried to contact her yourself? I did sort of think... That if she well, she must know what you're. I mean, well, she clearly, clearly. Well, she clearly did. Well, the Daily Mail yeah. told her. But also, I'm not exactly uh, a, 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 <laughs> somebody hard to contact, and she never did. And uh, it, you know, life is full of of things that you can't quite make sense of. And for me, that's one of them. But do you feel almost? I mean, I'm always fascinated watching who do you think you are, or the Nikki Campbell and Davina uh, McCall program, Long Lost Family. And you always want a happy ending. I mean, if she contacted you now, what would you want to ask her? She would need to wait and see what she had to say, is the answer. But it hasn't happened. And in my case, because I had a, step, a stepmother, I still have a stepmother who I'm very close to, yeah. and has played a big part in my life, and the manager of my children's home, I called her auntie. She was very close, you know, from the age of yeah. four. You absolutely need people you love and are close to as a child. And I did have that. It just wasn't, in my case, my mother. Because you, you were, I mean, it sounds odd given the circumstances, but you were very lucky in that regard because there are so many people, particularly nowadays, who go through the care system who don't have that and yes. are abused in awful ways. Completely and... right. And that's why one of the things I've done in the last 10 years, which I'm, I'm most proud of, is with a brilliant... A young man called Josh McAllister set up a charity called Frontline, which systematically recruits social workers from amongst the most able graduates. It's the social work equivalent of Teach First, which right. is the same. And yeah. when I was education minister, I gave a, a shed load of money to Teach First because I regard it as so important to get good teachers in state schools. It's really important, particularly in the most challenging ones. I was uh, there were so many things I was lucky about when I was a child. But as I look back on it, one of them is I had a very brilliant social worker, and it was the social worker who persuaded Camden Council which to send me to a boarding school, which they didn't normally do. And that was, in terms of my education, that was the breakthrough moment. It wouldn't have happened but for the social worker. And, you know, a typical child in care at the moment has a change of social worker every six months every six months and that is a good part of the reason why it doesn't work mm. i was very lucky i had one social worker for five years 
I'm still in touch with her. So, you know, these things, these things really matter. And these are, you know, it's obviously much better that families function, but at any one time there are 60 or 70,000 children in care who are literally the responsibility of the state, and the state has an absolute responsibility to do its best by them, and the least it can do is to see that there's some stability in their care placements and in adults to whom they relate who will take, you know, literally every week life-changing decisions about what's going to happen to them. You got married, you had two children, and then a couple of years ago um, I was flicking through the Evening Standard and I read an interview that you did with Julian Glover where you... I want to say came out as gay, but I'm not even sure that that's the right I- expression. And I mean, I had no idea. Well, I've always made it a point of principle because I don't expect, uh, indeed, I do expect the media not to pry into my private life. I do believe in a right of privacy. Mm. I never, ever talk about my, my kids or, 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 or my, my family apart from yeah. you know, my, uh, my upbringing, which is, um, is a matter of public record. And therefore, I don't really want to go there except to say, because this is just about me and it's not about them, that, uh, uh, that I am gay. And I did go through a long process of coming to terms with that, which I think in part was what's happened to a lot of people of my generation, of whom the, 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 the social conditioning was so powerful, mm. though you and I are the same age, when well, I, was, I always say, if I, if I had been born 10 years before I was, I'm sure that I would now have a wife and children. Well, it, the, uh, in the school I was at, I said it was a great school, but the homophobia was, it was mm. one of the most pronounced features of it. And I, I, even now, there's homophobic bullying, which takes place in schools, but then it was one of the dominant forms of bullying and indeed interaction between boys. I was at a boys' school. So for me, as a, as a teenager in my 20s, it's not just when people say, because you're not being true to yourself, it was simply unthinkable to be gay, as I look back on it. and Even uh, at university? At university, it, it, it took some time. When I was at university, I did not know anyone who was out gay. I didn't know anyone who was. Like, there were people who were, but I didn't know them. So I suppose it's a generational thing, and that's been part of the story of my life too. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to talk about about my, my, my family. No, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to, but there must have been, over a protracted period of time, quite an internal struggle for yeah. you. But then, like so many, so many so, people I know who've gone So through, why did you decide to go public? Well, I didn't really decide what happened at work. <laughs> really? Because it, well, I was asked in an interview, and I, I don't like, you know, uh, dod- dodging direct direct questions, but as you'll know, because you've looked at the record, I, I, I don't uh, spend much time talking about it. My view is that you a- absolutely, the public has an absolute right to know that their politicians are trustworthy. And I, I've got no problem with the media getting into, you know, the financial affairs of, of, of politicians, uh, their business uh, and professional lives and all that. But I do actually believe in a, a, a right of privacy in respect to people's families, provided they're not doing things that are, mm. uh, are illegal or, or hypocritical or things of that kind. And shall I tell you why I believe in it? Because, because I think it's absolutely right that the children of politicians, and I've seen so many children of politicians uh, who have been really seriously damaged by the experience of having the misfortune to be children, I think they have an absolute right to be outside the limelight, and that's what I've always tried to secure. What next for you? Because you're 58, you're not in your dotage. What, what, what do you see yourself doing in 10 years' time? Well, I'm uh, writing a lot. I seem to every year be writing you're a chapter very, for a new you're book even by more you. Prolific I, I'm, than I'm now I. writing a book for your <laughs> next book on monarchs. So I'm yes. writing um, King William IV, who's a, who's a, who's a very important monarch because of the passage of the Great Reform Act. I'm writing Tony Blair's biography. I'm chairman of the European movement. And I'm uh, still active in in labor politics and i i think that my that politics for me probably isn't over and the reason why i think it isn't because i'm in a sort of um conventional sense ambitious but i i i still profoundly believe that there needs to be a better plan for the country i don't think that uh, indeed you're I don't not think, a great fan of keir starmer are you well i think there needs to be a really strong plan for the country and uh, whether actually you're on the brexit side or the, or, or the the non-Brexit side of the debate, we now have a massive challenge as a country, made made more 
made bigger by COVID, to have a really serious plan for growth, for jobs, what's called levelling up, seeing that we're a much more successful society in all parts of the country, holding the United Kingdom together, which so far as, as England, Wales and Scotland is concerned, I think is hugely important. I think the, the situation in Ireland is different, but for, for Britain it's, it's, it's hugely important. And as I look around British politics at the moment, I don't see great plans. I see a shortage of leaders and a shortage of really serious and credible plans to make Britain better. And I sort of feel that uh, since that's what I've done for the last 30 years, I probably need to keep doing it. But you burnt, you burnt your boats with Keir Starmer, didn't you, when you called for him to be replaced? Well, Keir, I think, is, is on the up in the polls. And, and but look, do you rather regret saying that now? Well, no, what I would say is, which is important, you only ever have one leader at a time. And if that leader is there, you need to make it work. And Keir has, has, has many strong qualities, and I hope it can, can work with him, and we need to make it. And Keir, let's be clear, is the problem with Jeremy Corbyn is that Jeremy Corbyn was, wasn't just unelectable because of what he stood for, but he was uh, my own view was it was pretty hard. I mean, the 2019 election, where, of course, I didn't want Brexit to go through, so I had to bite my tongue a lot. There were clearly, let's be clear, going to be big problems about Jeremy Corbyn becoming Prime Minister. This is a guy who wasn't even prepared to condemn Russia after the poisoning in Salisbury. I mean, this was a really difficult situation for the country. Nobody, nobody doubts that Keir Starmer has the capacity to be Prime Minister. I mean, he's, you know, if he was had to take it on tomorrow, I don't think you or I would feel unsafe in but, any but way. But you don't think he can win the election? Well, I, 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 I want to do my best to see that we can make this work. You see, I think you're and, backtracking on what you said um, last year, aren't you? Well, I want, I want to make it work, and let's, let's, let's hope it's possible to make it work, because we need a choice at the moment, and I don't want the only choice facing the country to be Boris Johnson. You're, you, you're writing this biography of Tony Blair, Given your almost adoration of Tony Blair, do you think that you are the best person to write this book? Well, uh, there's no ideal relationship between a biographer and their subject. If you're too, is, is he cooperating with you? Well, he he knows he's not he's not cooperating in the sense he will never see any of the uh, of of the draft. Are you interviewing him? Uh, no, I'm not interviewing him. Uh, not not formally. I speak to him because uh, I speak to him mm. about politics. Uh, so. Uh, at one level, I'm uh, too close. At another level, because I'm close, I know exactly what happened and have a, an archive and a, a, a range of, um, of experience, which in some ways makes me the ideal biographer. So I think the true test is whether the book is any good when it comes out. And uh, if you think it's too hagiographic, you'll have, well, you I, won't hesitate to say so. I just, I just remember yeah, so. last week when you were on Cross Question and I asked you about uh, when he called anti-vax people idiots. And I said, do you think he was wrong to do that? And you immediately responded, um, what were your exact words? Can you remember what your exact uh, words were? Uh, I said, Tony Blair is never wrong about yes, anything. But you knew that I was pulling your leg. I know, I know. <laughs> and it was a very funny... It was it's a, always always, always dangerous making jokes. About and, well, it, it uh, is. But particularly when they're written up and they, you mm. can't quite see the humour. But also, I mean, was it last year you seriously posited Tony Blair making a comeback? That wasn't pulling anyone's leg, was it? Oh, no, I, ser I seriously... I thought it was mm. the right thing for the country. Then. I mean, I was pretty explicit about it. I think it's much harder now, because a year ago, we were in the middle of the COVID crisis. Labour had just lost the Hartlepool by-election. Do you, you remember? That was yeah. one of the biggest humiliations yeah. that the Labour Party suffered in its electoral history. And it was it was in a weak position electorally. And the, uh, Tony was clearly the person out there with a plan for the country, including a plan for dealing with COVID. So... There were moments in politics. I'm, I'm a profound believer that there were people and there were moments and they sometimes come together. Uh, Tony and the moment came together with the death of John Smith in 1994. I think actually, as I uh, thought it at the time, I think last year could have been a moment. Um, Tony didn't take that view and he didn't make a, make a move to re-enter politics then. Part of what I will be dealing with in the last chapter of my biography is whether that was whether there was a moment there or not. But I, don't, I think that moment... It's great counterfactual, but, isn't it? But I think the moment has passed. You can't now. quite see the circumstances where it could have happened. Well, the, well I think the, the moment was last summer when you had a, 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 a deepening COVID crisis and you had Labour really uh, in, 
on the skids electorally after the Hartlepool by-election. That moment, I thought then, was a moment. And Roy Jenkins at that moment, who was exceptionally bold in seizing the main chance in politics, I have a, had, as, as I said to Tony at the time, I think Roy Jenkins would have moved. Tony mm. didn't. That moment has passed. And I'm a profound believer in never looking backwards in politics. We're now in a, in a, a new situation now, and we need to, to make it work. And to give Keir his due, uh, Keir's nerve didn't flinch. He did stick at it all the way through. I admire people whose nerve doesn't flinch in politics, and let's hope he can make it work. When he was awarded a knighthood, I remember tweeting, this is what, only like what, a week, ten days ago, that... Um, all of the producers at speech radio stations over the new year will be thanking God for that move because, of course, it gave people something to talk about. Um, I know whenever Tony Blair is mentioned on social media or on the radio, um, the vitriol that, that comes forward in that, in a way, I would compare him to Margaret Thatcher here in that they are both... I mean, they both have their massive fans, mm. you and I being sort of on the opposite sides of that, but they they are reviled to such an extent that people lose all sense of perspective. And I wonder mm. whether you think that in 50, 100 years' time, when people are writing the history of the Blair government, he, he will be written up in a much kinder way than some contemporary commentators do now. Yeah, well, without doubt for this reason, that the, um, no one will be able to take away from him that he was prime minister who won three elections and was a very dominant figure, but also, crucially, few people, even his critics and most of his critics oddly are on the left because of the Iraq war few even of his critics deny that he left Britain in a better condition than he found it and most of their beef with him, which is a serious one was about the handling of international policy now you can have a, 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 a genuine debate about Iraq and, uh, and this will be a big big uh, feature of my book is what was the, what were the rights and wrongs of Iraq. But on the issue of governing Britain, you know, this is the guy who brought peace to Northern Ireland. I mean, you know, John Major started it, and John Major does, deserves a lot of credit, by the way. John Major was talking to the IRA long before it was publicly respectable to do so, but it was Tony who brought that ship into port. That is, by, by the way, I think the best thing that's happened to this country in the last 25 years is the end of a civil war in which we were engaged, where bombs were going off in London, mm. people were being maimed and killed on Oxford Street and in the city of London and so on. And he transformed... Uh, the public services, as we were discussing earlier. I think he stabilised uh, the United Kingdom. I, I don't think that Scotland would be part of the United Kingdom now if there hadn't been a, a big act of devolution. It's been difficult and problematic. You see some people say that actually we wouldn't be having all this debate now if devolution no, hadn't I, I happened. No, I think independence would have happened by now. I just don't think it was possible to maintain okay. a, a really strong sense of Scottish identity within a unitary state. And, 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 you know, the minimum wage, uh, we were civil partnerships. Uh, uh, most of the domestic stuff... That, that Tony Blair did, has not only remained entrenched, you know, the Conservatives didn't change it after 2010, but Labour people are hugely proud of, you know, trebled health spending in real terms, doubled education spending in real terms. If you're a social democrat or a socialist, what's not to like about that? And a growing economy for 10 years, much higher standards of living at the end than the beginning. So I think that his historical reputation will be strong, like Thatcher's, because there aren't many people who actually deny that Britain was in a better condition in 1990 than it was in 1979. You and I remember 1979. Mm. You know, the dead unburied, the, the rubbish piled high in the streets. I never had any doubt in 1979 that the country was on a precipice and it needed a real leader who could grab hold of it. You know, I didn't like what Thatcher did in the second half of her government in particular, but you did need to have strong leadership which was going to resolve this problem of overweening union power in the 1970s. So I think his historical reputation will be strong on balance, but Iraq is never going to go away. And this issue about how do you deal with what are essentially rogue states and how far does the West, the democratic West, get involved in trying to basically take over these rogue states, which mm. is what happened in the case of Iraq. That is one of the big problematic issues of our age. Tony had one answer to it. The other part of the left that thought he was profoundly wrong because what he was doing was neo-imperial have a different answer, which is that you keep completely out and you hope it's possible to reform from the inside. And that, I think, is going to be one of the big continuing debates of our time because what you obviously can't say is that the Taliban in Afghanistan and Saddam Hussein 
uh, in Iraq was the highest point of civilization for these countries. I mean, these were people who were literally terrorizing their own people, and it's happening again in Afghanistan now. So if the answer isn't the West getting directly involved, what is the answer? And that, I think, is going to be a big issue for the next few generations, and it will be forever tied up with the debate about Tony Blair and his legacy. Well, we started off with a meaty subject. We've finished with a meaty subject. We've been talking now for, I think, an hour and a half. Anything that I've missed out? Because I haven't got a list of questions. We've just been having a conversation. Anything that you would have liked to have been asked that you haven't been? Well, the... A lot of people watching this will say uh, that all politicians are, you know, the same and that it's uh, a pretty low-grade profession and all that. And I just want to say, because somebody's been involved in it for a long period of time, most of the people, not all of them, most of the people that I've engaged with have been in it for the right reasons. Obviously, there's been personal ambition. Sometimes there's been skullduggery. In what walk of life isn't that true? But they've mostly been in there because they want to, to make their communities and their societies a better place. And, you know... I think they deserve a better press. And I just want to say to you, Ian, because you're one of the, the foremost interviewers of politicians, part of what brings this out is conversations like this and your uh, show that you do, you do it every night, don't you, which brings politicians together. And what I'm struck by as I listen to it and have been on it is it's very striking that even in Brexit, even when we're sort of at, at daggers drawn, our politicians, because we have a strong democratic tradition and we're a fairly united society, tend to agree more than they disagree. And I just wish we spent a bit more time talking about the things we agree on rather than well, just the is, things we disagree on. That is such a good on. point. When, when David Amos was murdered, and this week we've had the sad death of Jack Dromey and people saying lovely mm. things about them both, mm. and you think, well, wouldn't it be nice if, if you'd said those said. things when they'd been yeah. alive? Well, we're now doing it, and we that's are. a great note to end on, isn't it? Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Join us again next week for another edition of Ian Dale All Talk. Goodbye.